Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. To the dude from Manhattan, they meant death. I'm sure you'll edit this out, but just hearkening back to, to last week is there, there were two songs that got me into that band. And one of them was uh, a Buffalo Tom song called Bird Brain. Yes. We were thinking about doing this song. I was like, oh, you mean this one? And I knew it. And they were like, yes. Dave's <laughs> rolling. Welcome to Abandoned Albums, the documentary podcast where we take a closer look at some albums that may have been forgotten about over time and some albums you may not even know existed. I'm your host, Keith R. Higgins, and sharing mic duties today with me is Rob Janicki, creator of the ongoing multimedia project, Generation Riff. Hey, Keith, how are you? You know, Rob, I am A-OK. Apparently, I've got my deep FM radio voice on today. <laughs> On this episode of Abandoned Albums, Rob and I return to our conversation with author Eric Beatner. Now here in part two, you'll hear Eric button up his days with Go Dog Go and how that led into his next project, Build Your Own Monster. So without any further ado, here is part two of our conversation with Eric Beatner. Now, is that Flip Records? Do I have that right? Is that the same Flip Records as Limp Biscuit? Well, uh, here's what happened. We... <laughs> We signed to Flip Records. Yes, we did. Uh, we had managers who were just sort of friends of ours. They were not music managers. They were they were two gals who were friends and wanted to get into this. They believed in us and wanted to do us a favor. And we said, sure, yeah, give it a shot. Take take the, our demo tape around. We had like a five track demo tape. Take it around. See what you can do. Can't hurt anything. And uh they somehow got it in the hands of the folks at, at Flip, which was a, uh, an upstart indie label, uh, you know, with eyes on much bigger things. But they were brand new. And so they offered us a deal. They, they had an office in L.A. and an office in New York. We met uh, with the guy in L.A., liked what he was saying. We signed with him and were sort of curious to see who else they were going to sign and then uh, it was before the album even came out. It was about six months, I guess, after we were doing that. We were making plans to record the album. We And then we went in studio, got the tracks, and then right after that found out that the the two principals, the L.A. guy and the New York guy, were, were splitting. So we had a choice to make that we had signed to Flip but hadn't met any of the New York people. The guy in L.A. was going to break off and do his own thing. He was the guy we knew. The guy from New York flew out and met with us, and we had a very nice conversation. He had listened to the album. He had ideas about what he wanted to be a single, which was the last song on the album that we ever thought anybody would put out, and we did not want that to be the single. So between that and we had a relationship already with the guy in L.A., we stuck with the guy in L.A. So it ended up... Uh, you know, we signed to Flip, and then it came out. He his version was called Risk Records, mm. which you know, shame on us for not seeing the writing on the wall there. To be honest, <laughs> if you can name your label Risk, <laughs> so. Bob was growing up too. He knew about the reproductive organs and nocturnal emissions. He also knew about masturbation. How did the label treat you overall? Uh, you know, it's. I th I think it's a probably a pretty common indie rock story. I, I think the the main issue in retrospect was being a brand new label, being an upstart label. They didn't yet know who they were, and I'm a big believer in independent labels and having that brand identity. That you know, I, I grew up. It's like when I was growing up, if it was out on Discord. I could buy it unheard and know I was probably going to dig it. And indie labels that cultivate a sound, you know, if you bought something that was on 4AD, you knew it was going to have a certain sort of Brit pop sound. If you bought something on Amphetamine Reptile, it was going to have a real hard, you know, sound. Same thing, Merge and Touch and Go. And all these labels had a sound that you kind of brought to it already, knowing what you were going to get. And so these guys were were brand new didn't have that in mind. I think they were trying to be 
uh, you know, an alternative label. And at that time in the you know mid late nineties, alternative was, was very much a catch all. And they were trying to sort of put an entire Lollapalooza lineup worth of bands on one label. So when we did, uh, we did like a, a showcase here in LA for the label with all of their signed acts. And it was us, they had, uh, they had a band called the autumns who were, very, very steeped in the entire catalog of the Smiths. So not a band that we would ever have played with live. They had a band called Laughing Us, who were very like industrial, kind of very ministry sounding, uh, you know, an electronic you know, drum machine kind of vibe. And then they had a band called Jack Off Jill, who were uh, very goth kind of, you know, proto metal. Their, their big claim to fame was uh, they were friends with Marilyn Manson and he had produced their first single. Mm. So when we did the showcase here in LA, it was those bands all in a row. So they invited like a bunch of industry people and press people. And I think it just gave people whiplash. It was like every new band that came on, you'd be like, well, okay, well that's a completely different sound. What is this label? Who are they? So I think that was one of the downfalls right there. It, it benefits you to pick a lane and stick with it. The label was responsible for also hooking you up with the booking agent, which we call from episode one. Didn't really do much booking at all, as it were. No, he was terrible. I'll tell my uh, my my worst gig ever story because th th those always go over well. <laughs> but <laughs> you know what, what you're saying is like the the way that I always dealt with you know a, a show that went badly and 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 not to you know try not to want to just kill yourself is it, you, you have to do fine you can find some entertainment in it and you can find a little bit of excitement in being uh you know not what people expected they got us an opening uh slot with incubus uh before they had hit big but they were they were definitely an up-and-coming california band i think they'd already been signed but they 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 weren't who they became, but they were definitely on everyone's radar. And they said, Oh, you, you, we got you this gig. You got to do it. And our van was still broken from the tour. This was up in San Luis Obispo. It's like uh, 150 miles North. So we're like, well, we're going to have to rent a van. They're like, no, no, it's, this is going to be great. It's a college town. You got to go. So we went and we were so used to in LA, we're so used to getting hustled on and off and they would put five, six, seven bands on a night. We, we had like a 25 minute set. It was like five songs. And we got up there and we walk in. They're like, oh, no, it's just you and the other guys. Like, you, you, you play for an hour. We're like, oh, my God. We're scrambling. We're adding songs. We're doing this thing. They fed us dinner. And it was like this like restaurant nightclub. And so I, we, we, st we start to set up. And there are people right in front of the stage eating dinner. And we know what we sound like. <laughs> and we're talking to the sound guy. We're like, so do these people move? He's like, oh, yeah, you know, eight o'clock, the kitchen shuts down. They all move. And then it'd be it's like, you're going to be fine. And I said, so did you have you guys heard the album? He's like, no, no, no. But you, your label guy said it's going to be great. I'm like, OK. And here's the thing. We don't think we're that weird. We, we had no perspective. We thought we were perfectly normal. We were wrong. We started playing our hour long set and they were. 25, 30 people there, three songs into it, there were like six people left and they were against the back wall. Five songs into our hour long set, the manager came to the front of the stage and you know she looks at me and she, and she goes, two more. And the other guys were like, what did she say? And I had to turn around and go, we just got pulled. <laughs> oh man. So we were like, oh, you know, what do we do now? And we just said, fuck it and we played bloated worm which is like our nine minute jazz odyssey off the go Don't go record <laughs> which is just noise and it's confusing to people and we were like fuck it this is what we're doing and so we played that just as this giant metal finger and then the minute we finished the sound guy is up there he's unhooking mics he's wrapping cables and i said to him i said hey dude are we really that are we that weird and he was oh yeah no this was not the right place for you <laughs> <laughs> but we were like hey you know what we, we did the show and what are you gonna do like, we, even in the right there in the moment we were able to laugh about it and i think it's the only yeah. way you can survive <laughs> absolutely that's great shortcuts often lead to trouble and thus loss of emotional control you've heard haste makes waste so was there one 
particular thing that 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 caused Go Dog Go to break up, or was it just sort of an accumulation of things and just sort of like? Pshh. Was there a big band flare out? Let's go for the salacious gossipy stuff. <laughs> no, there was not. There, there definitely was not. I mean, I think we we sort of sputtered out. And after we realized that it, that nothing was going to come of this and we had we had left the label, we realized that nothing else was, you know, the, the moment that we realized that uh, the relationship with the label was over was was a very specific moment. Tim uh, Christopher, the drummer and I went over to the label to talk about this was after the album was out for a couple of months after we had done our tour. We were going to talk about next steps and, you know, because I was very big on trying to get opening slots for other bands, you know, bands that we would be in front of a friendly audience. And, you know, I, I would have gladly gone, you know, out on the warp tour over the summer, you know, whatever that kind of, I, I wanted to get out on the road. I wanted to be a, be a road dog. It was harder for the other guys in the band to do that, especially Craig, the bass player. He was the only one who at the time was married with a kid. So his touring schedule was a lot, lot more limited than the rest of us. Uh, that started to become a real factor. And then realizing that the label wasn't really going to put much behind us, Tim and I went to the offices one time to have a meeting to talk about next steps. So we walked in and they had, you know, eight by tens, you know, band photos of all, of all their bands on the wall. And we noticed that since the last time we'd been there, someone had slid the potted palm in front of our photo. <laughs> So, oh, no. <laughs> so you could see all the other bands, but you had to sort of part the leaves of this potted plant to see us. We were like, yeah, I don't think they're really behind us anymore. <laughs> yeah. so, That's unfortunate. Yeah. But I think, you know, in, in the end, it was just a question of like, OK, it's time to start over. Let's try to look for a brand new deal. Let's you know, what can we do to change up how we're playing shows? Because we, we were at a point where we, we would take any show anywhere, anytime. And it, that just got to be a pointless grind. And then Craig started talking about, well, his wife wants to move back to Mississippi where they were from. There's really nothing keeping them here in L.A. They wanted the quieter life, a cheaper life. And then eventually that's uh, that's what did it. Craig left town. Tim went on to start Build Your Own Monster, right? Build Your Own Monster. Yes. Immediately? Did you take a break from each other? Uh, no, it, it was pretty immediate. We, we, we talked about it. We said, yeah, we, we want to keep going. Uh, Tim Chris, or, uh, Tim Boyd, rather, the saxophone player, was, was with us, too. He, he was going to come along, but you could start to see it in his eyes where it wasn't really he, – he wasn't that excited about starting over from square one. Uh, but we found a, a new bass player pretty quickly, Annie Chang, uh, who was fantastic and was such a breath of fresh air to the band, which I think was one of the reasons why we decided to change names. And we felt it was important to have a new identity with the new member and, you know, see see where the new sound was going to take us. What's the impetus behind Build Your Own Monster? So I, I can sort of we can sort of piece together Go Dog Go, favorite children's book. But what about Build Your Own Monster? We ha I, I still remember it very specifically. We, there, right down the road from our practice space was a Denny's. And we all went after practice one night and we sat at the Denny's and we were going to hash out what's the new band name. And uh, everyone brought uh, some ideas. And uh, Tim had brought some old comic books from when he was a kid. 
and he was leafing through in the back and Bill Drone Monster comes from one of those ads in the back of a comic book. You know, there's those little like, you know, two inch by three inch ads for, you know, one's for a pop gun and one's for X-ray specs and all these different things. And one was for this little kit called Build Your Own Monster. And it had the little graphic that we ended up putting on our T-shirts and everything. And we just as soon as he said that, he was like, I saw this. And I was like, oh, that's it. Oh, that's great. Yes. Perfect. Done. And, And it was it was a very quick decision. As soon as I heard that, I said, yep, that's it. No, no other entries. We have a winner. I thought there was going to be a, a Denny's connection because isn't there sort of like a build your own blank at Denny's? We were one step away from the band being called Moons Over My Hammy. So let's all <laughs> thank our stars that we were smart enough to recognize that was a dumb idea. I don't know. <laughs> Cut to Hootie and the Blowfish t- sells 20 million records. Who the hell can tell anymore? <laughs> Listening to both records, the bass is one thing that was clearly different. Bass is my favorite instrument. And I listened to it pretty intently and you, you, you can hear the difference. And it, even though you're probably writing the bulk of the music, right. On, on both records, the songs are different because, and I think that's the, at least to my ears, that's what I, that's what I heard on both records, how different the bass sound was and what it did to the songs. Yeah, for sure. I, and I think, you know, it, it, it was such a, it was such a refreshing way to, continue the band in a lot of ways and yet also have a fresh start just bringing in that that one new element and and you know tim boyd on saxophone he he ended up quitting pretty early on he used to play with us pretty regularly for about two or three months and he just showed up to practice one night and he was like i i'm done i'm 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 out of things to play he needed to move on. And we said, great. And we said, hey, but, you know, we're recording. Would you mind popping in? So he d- he does a couple of guest spots on the album, which we were really grateful for. So, so again, no animosity. It was just his time to go. And then so from there on, we, we were just a three piece and, you know, just try exploring uh, a slightly different sound. It's not it's not a radical departure, but it's it's a it's a slightly different sound for sure. Where did you record? The record. Uh, it, it was just at some studio. Some some dude had had a studio. It was it was a pretty good sized studio. I mean, I obviously the record is not as sonically uh, clean as as the Go to Go record. It was three days, I think, of recording to get that entire <laughs> record <laughs> recorded and and mixed. Uh, so we do we did it super quick. I I brought a cup a bunch of CDs uh, you know to the guy who engineered it and said I I I'm looking for this kind of sound and you know we did, we didn't quite get there but at least I was able to give him a reference of you know what we were trying to go for what were the reference CDs the sound I, I want to interrupt because before you answer I heard some things on the record and I took notes yeah all right I, you, I'm t- gonna, I'm, you tell me <laughs> I'm going to tell you I I was the first record I did okay on. Right. I mean, first record when we spoke yeah. about it, I, I think I did all right. And what's really cool about this one is I heard some of the similar influences, but I heard a few more and it's kind of varied all over the place. One that struck me right away was um, at the drive in. I heard mm. a lot of that kind of, the, the, you know, the, maybe even more of the feel of it, that just the chaos and yeah. the, 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 you know, left turns and, and, you know, oh, I wasn't expecting that at this moment, you know. At the drive-in for sure, especially on um, Four Cornered Crown. This one may be a little bit, I, I don't know if you'll agree, but uh, the, the track Unfair sounded a little bit like um, like Bleach era Nirvana to me. Uh, yeah, I could hear that. Um, so those, and, and there were more, but those were the ones that really stuck out. I was like, wow, I, I, you know, and I'm a big fan of At The drive So when I heard that, I was like, this is really cool. I like the the chaos of this. And, and, and that kind of came to mind real quick. So how'd I do? 
Uh, very well. Yeah, I think At the Drive-In was was something I was listening to definitely a, a lot at that time. I mean, like that album Relationship of Command, I think, had just come out at, at that time. Uh, and I mean, such a fantastic band. Oh, my God. And and I think the platonic ideal in my head for a live act, too. When you go see a band, I want to know that they're giving it their all. And for God's sake, nobody did that like At the Drive-In. And I encourage everyone at home listening Go on YouTube and look up at the drive-in playing one arm scissor on the David Letterman show of all places. I mean, the one album sonically, I think that I that I pointed to at that time was uh, Burning Airlines first record. I don't know if you know that one. Jay Robbins from Jawbox. It was his first uh, post Jawbox record. Um, and he produced that and he's has become one of the greatest like hard alternative rock producers uh, going his, his studio that he owns uh, back in maryland just put has put out some of the most amazing and sonically just gorgeous gorgeous records and that burning airlines record the first one to listen to the guitar tones and that if, if you want to really get into like the technical side of that if you're a real audiophile that is just one of the great guitar sounds on on album that i've ever heard and so i brought in that i was like i want my guitars to sound like this and of course they don't on, on this record but that that was the uh, the mountain i was trying to climb <laughs> i still think the record sounds pretty pretty damn good i mean i will say i i thought it sounded very very good well hey, this is what's interesting and i i do i want to flip this a little bit on you guys and i want to ask you some questions because this is such a fascinating thing to me of being able to talk to people who have no pre-existing relationship with the music at all and it, you know th this is not an episode where you guys are talking about a record that came out in the 80s and we've had time to think about it and its place in the world this was completely cold to you you know when, when we first started talking so i'm always curious because i get very insecure about both my vocals and my guitar playing and yet through my completely untrained guitar style I think I, I hope that I found, you know, somewhat of, of a unique sound in there. And I, I'm always curious how that comes across. Like how, when, when you hear the guitar playing, do you think, oh, this guy just learned by himself in his bedroom? Or do you think, oh, yeah, this guy studied. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> I hear this guy knows what he's doing. And I hear that you're playing to the music that you're playing. I would have no I, I wouldn't know if anyone went to you know juilliard or right <laughs> or the place what's the one in boston um berkeley yeah berkeley but no i think when i listen to your guitar i think it it's playing perfectly with the songs that you're playing you know and that's why when we talked in the last episode about space girl i'm like well wait a second this is just a really lovely departure from what <laughs> i was hearing you know and it's a really nice counterbalance your vo your vocals again same thing i mean I thought they were a little clearer and better on this record. Okay. And, and I, I liked the tone of this record. You know, right, it was a little bit, well, Rob and I talked about this. I mean, punk just and that sort of, it's not really my, my go-to, but I, there was seemed to be a softer tone that was more palatable for me. I, I don't, I don't know if that makes any sense, but your guitar playing. No, I think, I think it's perfect. So that style of music has been around my head and my ears for a really, really long time. So I clearly felt like you know what you're doing. And I always thought that you had a real strong intent on like you, you were you were kind of laser focused on what you wanted to do. I don't think it kind of came out of the air and you just sort of like, you know, found a chord or found a riff. Like, I think you had an idea and you executed it. And it's it's almost um, militant at times. Like you yeah. you you got it done. Whatever you were thinking. And there's no way for me to know that because I don't. I didn't know you. I wasn't <laughs> in the room when you were recording it. But the sound is deliberate. It is fierce, and it has a a uh, a unique quality. I like the chaos. I like the kind of all over the place. I'm not expecting this next part to pop up. And I don't think that can ever happen by accident. I think you have to know what you're doing to do that. And your vocals, I've always liked on both records, too. I'm a fan of the aggression. I'm a fan of the of, of the screaming. Um, and I don't think you scream for the sake of it. I think it fits when you do it. Writing some of those songs and then 
having those moments where it is very deliberate, like, you know what, let's, we, we need a rhythm change here. I, well, I, I want to change the timing and, and, and trying to do stuff very purposely just to kind of mess it, messy it up a little bit. In a moment, it'll be time to go on with the show. But first, I'd like to tell you about the very important savings you can make on your new car. Thanks to the new low prices announced just a few weeks ago by... Lyrically, looking back on it, I often wish that I had written more coherent lyrics and, or stuff with, <laughs> that told more of a story or, or something. But, you know, the the meaning behind the lyrics was never paramount for me. And I wonder, like, just as music fans, if that's the kind of thing. Because obviously, I think the songs that last longest with us and the songs that... that the largest amount of people can latch on to is always going to be songs that you can connect with lyrically and that ring true. I mean, it's like, can you imagine being Mick Jagger and writing a line like you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes you get what you, and every single person on the globe goes, yes, oh, you get me. <laughs> you know? But you know, my, I, my, I was often more interested in the sounds of words butting up against each other than any sort of actual meaning. Does that, does that keep you at arm's length from a song? To me, to some extent, yes, it does. Yeah. Um, I am a story person. I like, I need something relatable for me to get in. Mm -hmm. Once I get in, you can fuck with me all you want, but I need something to get in. I need that hook. And, and for me, it's a story. Yeah. And again, like looking back on it, I, I wish I'd done that more because I, I, I do think you're right. And, and I think the song, I, I, you know, some of it, too, is like at, at the time, you know, one of my favorite bands in the world is Shudder to Think, another DC Discord band. And, you know, Craig would write lyrics that you couldn't interpret with, a, you know, a master's degree from Harvard. And but somehow i i loved it still and I, and and i don't know if i you know whether it's trying to emulate that or whether also i think there's a certain thing of being a reluctant lyricist and a reluctant singer cuz yeah, i mean here's the other thing that that we, we didn't really talk about last time is that i was i never set out to be the vocalist in a band it it was never my intention all my band you know i i, I was in a hardcore band in high school, not the vocalist. I was in an acoustic band in college, not the vocalist. I was in like an alternative rock band post-college, not the vocalist. I was always just a guitar player. So I think when I started singing and then writing lyrics, I was reluctant to be vulnerable and write about myself. I could never write lyrics like Bono does. I, I could never just say, here's my heart on a platter, hope you can relate to it but those are the songs that all of a sudden now you got a stadium of 60,000 people who go yes this is i you get me you're speaking to my soul my answer to eric's question has to do i think with melody more than it does um mm. lyrics and the style of music because i do love lyrics but eric to your direct question about your music music and the lyrics for me, sort of usually have to go together. So, and in the kind of music you write, it, it, I wouldn't expect lyrics to be telling a, a story. I would yeah. expect them to almost be as chaotic and, 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 and odd sometimes as the music. Hardcore music or, 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 or punk rock or whatever you want to call it, I think should be challenging in every single way, you know, sonically and lyrically. But the lyrics themselves, I think, fit the music perfectly. Yeah, it's it's a hard thing to try to, you know, get get across something like, I, I mean, I, and obviously it's like I I write novels. I I've, I believe in stories. I I, I like storytelling, uh, you know. But I I've, I I guess like in the songwriting medium, I'm I'm never going to write Alice's Restaurant and and just sort of like transpose a short story <laughs> under a, a guitar riff, you know. It's just not it's not something I'm ever going to do. But I think you know when when I started to you know after Bill Drum Monster broke up and I was playing out a couple of just sort of solo acoustic shows and stuff. If you listen to quieter song, you know something like Space Girls. Space Girls got a narrative. It's that there's a story there. There's characters, and I think. I think you're right. Like th there's just something about when I'm sitting down and just writing a song on an acoustic guitar and that's all you're going to hear is the voice and one instrument. You're zeroed in on the lyrics and it's your obligation as a songwriter to make something that people are going to track a, a lot more, you know, 
in you know if i'm in the middle of mercurochrome I, I you know there's such chaos going on i can write a line like attack me with a tourniquet drown in mercurochrome and it kind of doesn't matter <laughs> what that means <laughs> Did you tour behind this record? We we played uh, Southern California. We, I, I don't think we ever left the state uh, on that one. You know, one of the things that I was very interested in, because I, I became our sole booking person, uh, and I finally, probably too late, realized the, the folly of taking any show anytime, anywhere. Uh, I just got tired of playing at midnight on a Wednesday to nobody there. And and so I started being really aggressive at finding touring bands and finding bands that I liked and trying to say, hey, we'll, we'll open for you. We'll help you promote the show. We'll I'll help you book it. Uh, so we ended up getting on with some of my absolute favorite bands. We played shows with the Dismemberment Plan who are one of my favorite bands of all time. That was a huge highlight of, of my playing life was getting to open for them. Uh, we played with a, a band called Shiner out of Kansas City, who Tim and I both loved. We played with uh, a Q and Not You, another Discord band who was just phenomenal. We played with Ted Leo. Uh, so w- once we started being really aggressive and trying to cherry pick friendly uh, bands to open for, the shows got a lot better and and our experience was was a lot more fun doing that. We ended up playing less, which I don't think was a bad thing. Uh, but yeah, we so we we played mostly, you know, L.A. up to Santa Barbara, down to San Diego, inland, that kind of thing. And, you know, and we tried to take we got a lot of weird offers. We played we played a thing called Noise Fest down in uh, Orange County, which was, you know, almost like avant-garde jazz kind of stuff. And we sort of, as I was talking, they invited us and I was talking to the guy, I was like, so, have you heard our stuff? And he had heard, you know, select things. So I was like, all right, we have to tailor the set list for this venue. <laughs> you know, so we played the, the weirdest stuff we had. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, we, we, we ended up, I think, playing a, a pretty decent amount, but the the, it was really obvious when we were in front of a friendly crowd versus when we were just playing some random bar what brought about the demise of build your own monster was it just sort of the similar thing that i think it was just the grind of it and and everyone kind of moving on and getting older and uh you know i've i got i was married and i didn't have kids yet but my wife was not thrilled at uh you know the the amount of money it costs to be in an indie band because it's you don't make money it costs you money you know we we had a practice space that was a lockout like the, so i was paying rent on that and you know it's just got to be of a, a grind and it and you know as everyone's sort of also building their own careers and and you have to chase what is paying your rent or your mortgage uh it just got to be a little much so i think um you know, again, there was there was no blow up. It was no animosity. It just sort of had run its course. And we all had to say, well, all right, you know what? This is this is as big as it's ever going to get. And so we need to move on. So it's it's the kind of thing where I I miss it every day. Every day I miss playing music. And if you were to say to me, do you want to join a band and go play clubs and 
you know, haul your equipment around and try to hustle to get people to show up on a Tuesday night, I would say, I do not want to do that anymore. Right. <laughs> it's yeah. just, there's a, there's a reason why 95% of all rock bands are guys in their early, early 20s. You know, it just, you, you reach a point where you're like, oh God, I just can't face hauling. The, I, I had a, my amplifier was heavy, man. I just couldn't do it. Mmm, you know? <laughs> solid. She researched 197 vegetable oils until she found the purest. That's all I ever wanted to do was, you know, I mean, that's why I wanted to be on tour. That's why I wanted to go play. Like there were just clubs I wanted to play because I knew about them. There were places that, you know, like getting to play on stage at the whiskey. Mm -hmm. It's like, we had terrible shows when we were there. No, nobody showed up, but I was still, I fucking played the whiskey. That's cool. Like I, I wish I could have played CBGB. I wish I could have played, you know, the rat in Boston, all these other places that I used to go to all the time. As much as I can look back and say like, well, that didn't work out. And, you know, uh, we, we, we got close. We, you know, we, we, I, I signed a record deal. I, I have sat in a room and signed a record deal. And, you know, we were on the CMJ charts, even though we were number 285 or whatever, you know, like all that kind of stuff where it's like, you can go, well, this, that, that was kind of a flame out. It's like, but you know what? We did it. And, and we, we gave it our best. And, and I, I played every goddamn show like it meant something. And I wrote, a ton of songs that and even if only a small percentage of them are ones that I can really truly believe in and and still you know show people today I still like I can still play some songs to my kids or to people that I meet and I can be damn proud of that I did that and there's also the added bonus of people knowing me and then being able to put on some of that stuff and just seeing the look on their face when they go but that's you that, yes. yeah. What are you so angry about? Why are you screaming? <laughs> <laughs> that's still one of the best things. Oh, that's great. Yep. That's awesome. Thank you again, Eric. This was good fun. Thank you so much, guys, for, for having me yeah. back. I, I can't believe you, you are that interested, but it's fantastic. It was great, Eric. Thanks. Thanks a lot for your time. Abandoned Albums was recorded at Thunder Love Studios. Produced and written by Keith R. Higgins and Rob Janicki. Engineered and mixed by Steve Beasley. Edited by A.J. Royce. Original music by Mike Pellegrino. Many thanks to Eric Beatner. The songs you heard during this podcast were all taken from the Build Your Own Monster album, Giant Size Wonderment. And they were Lazy Halos, Mercurochrome, and Four Cornered Crown. Giant Size Wonderment is available to stream from your favorite streaming service. The Go Dog Go album, Glad to Be Unhappy, is currently unavailable to stream. However, we did receive Eric's consent, and you can download the album by going to AbandonedAlbums.com. Be sure to check out Eric's new book, Two in the Head, from your local independent bookseller. Or, you know, the other one. If you like what you've heard, be sure to subscribe and follow us on social media. At Twitter, we are at Abandoned Albums, and on Instagram, we are at Abandoned underscore Albums. As always, thanks to... Rob Janicki, S.W. Loudon, Nathan Sage, Steve Beasley, Mike Pellegrino, Therina Bella, and of course, our executive producer, Rufus Thunderlove. And now, until we meet again next time, I remain as always obediently yours.